Hey, I'm Eric Perkins. Welcome back for episode 13 of Building a House Start to Finish. This week, I'm on the job with the subcontractors that have special licenses for doing electrical plumbing and heat and air. You may wonder where the guys are at. Well, they've been with Jamie making some huge progress on the 120 Main Street project. Hey, I'm doing it over here too. Oh, are you painting too? Yeah. No, I'm just filming Ray. Yeah, I guess you only film Golden Boy. I'm just filming Ray. He just does it right, you know? I don't know. Wow, look at that. Man, Ray, that's fun to watch. Ray, that's... he's the best. He's so fast. Ray is. Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. I don't want you to see no, that. No, no, I want to no, watch get you get away. No. <laughs> no, go ahead. No. You, you show me the Duncan run, too. No, you can show me, too. Oh, oh, I see. That, that's good. No, I don't want to show no. you. Get away. No, that's real That's real nice. You know, he, he's got it, though. I'm not worried about it. So there's a lot going on in this episode. I'm going to try to squeeze in as much as I can. Let's start with the plumbing. Our plumber started by finishing the drain side of this plumbing system, and this is the drain box underneath the shower where the P-trap will go. You can remember in a previous episode, we set this box in before we poured the slab so that it would make a void in the concrete for this. This shower drain is especially made for tile showers. It's adjustable up and down so that you can set the height to match your shower pan plus the thickness of your tile. And here's a look at the drain and the P-trap all hooked up. This hole will be filled with concrete or compacted gravel before we pour a shower pan that slopes towards this drain later. After cutting a PVC pipe, you have to do a process called deburring. This will get these little spurs off the cut and keep them from catching stuff later when the pipes are in use. Hold on, pull it back down real quick. I'm going to bend this gusset plate over. So here's a problem. Installing a super long piece of a rigid pipe through trusses like this is not really possible. So the plumbers have to fit pieces as long as they can and then join those shorter pieces to make one long run. And they have to do this everywhere in the house where they can't get a longer piece in like this. Here's that stupid song. Mm -hmm. Making a joint in this PVC pipe is a two-step process. First, the pipe is primed with this purple looking primer and then PVC cement is added to each side after that. Then the plumber twists the pipe in and holds it. And holds it. This is a very important step of the process, evidently. How long do we wait? This is why you need two by six walls. <laughs> Instead of two by four. Look, it fits perfect though. Yes. It's a perfect fit. But you can't drill. You gotta go through the wall. I don't wanna make it too easy for you guys. Actually, this is. We ain't got a stud guard and all that stuff. This is nice. Here we're drilling to install an anti siphon frost proof hose bib out onto the patio. The anti-siphon part of that means that there is a valve that prevents backflow of water from outside to inside your potable water system. The frost-free part is what you're looking at here. The knob on the outside of the house actually shuts the water on and off about eight inches inside the house at the end of this pipe. When it shuts off, the rest of the water will then drain out because this pipe is set out of level, which is what he's doing now. This pipe will come into the backside of the sink base in our kitchen. And just FYI, if you leave a hose attached to your hose bib in freezing weather, that can prevent the water from draining and cause this thing to freeze anyway. Most of the supply side of the plumbing in this house is PEX, but there's still a few copper sections like this piece that goes between the shower valve and the shower head. The process being shown here is called sweating a joint, and it's using a torch and solder to make a leak-proof joint on these copper pipes. Brass fittings and crimp rings are used to connect the PEX pipe on the other supply lines of this house. Another code thing for plumbing and for wiring are these protective nail plates, and they protect the plumbing or the wiring from being shot with finish nails as you're installing the baseboard, and it really does work. If you shoot that with a finish nail, it just bounces off. Let's talk about this part right here, the P-trap, really quick. If you're not familiar with plumbing, what this thing does is holds water. Like, this stays full of water all the time once it's used and fills up. And that keeps the sewer gas from coming up. This is connected to the septic tank from coming up and coming out into your house. So if you smell sewer gas in your house, it's possible that one of your P-traps has dried out, like in a shower that you don't use very often or a sink that you never use. 
So that's how that works. It just keeps the sewer gas smell out of your house with the liquid that sits in it. Pretty smart. And here's another type of plumbing, installing a well pump deep, deep in this well that we have drilled on the property. It's about 700 feet deep and these pieces of pipe are threaded together, dropped in along with a wire that powers the pump all the way down to about 20 feet from the bottom. Before the piece of pipe is disconnected from the boom, it's clamped right on top of the well head so it doesn't just fall down in the well once it's disconnected from up top. Then the next section of pipe is prepped and threaded together with a metal coupling and dropped down in the well. And this process is repeated over and over until the well pump reaches the desired depth in the well. If your well is deeper than 800 feet or so, you have to use metal pipes instead of these PVC pipes in order to be strong enough to hold the weight of the well pump way down at the bottom. Once the well is completed, it's finished off with a well seal that keeps groundwater and pests from getting in the well, and also a spigot where the county can take water to test the water to make sure it's not contaminated. Next, we had to run a water line from the wellhead over to the house, which is about 200 feet, and also a heavy duty underground rated power cable from the house back to the well to power the pump. This all has to be about 18 inches below grade so it doesn't freeze in the winter. This water line turns up in the bottom of our footing where the sleeve comes through and into the house. It has to be below the footing because it has to stay 18 inches below grade. Next, we installed a valve box with a shutoff valve so that the water can be shut off just outside of the house in case you want to winterize it or in case you need to shut it off for an emergency. This box will give access to the valve below grade at any point. Next, we added a coupling to go from one inch PVC to one inch PEX, and then we glued up the rest of the 20 foot sections of pipe that ran all the way back to the well. All right, let's take just a second to thank our sponsor for today's video, Skillshare. And if you don't know what Skillshare is, it's an online learning community where millions of people come together to take the next steps in their creative journey. Skillshare offers thousands of classes for lifelong learners and entrepreneurs like me, ranging anywhere from art to music to graphic design. So right now I'm taking Storytelling 101 with Daniel Jose Older. I'm very excited to be here. Welcome to the class. We are going to talk about the fundamentals of storytelling, craft, conflict, character, and context. And I'm also using what I have learned to become a better narrator for the videos that I make on YouTube. I wanna mention that Skillshare is curated with learning in mind, so there are no ads, and they are also always launching new creative classes. Also, Skillshare is very affordable, less than $10 a month with a yearly membership. And the first 1,000 of my subscribers that click the link in the description will get a free two-month trial of premium subscription so you can explore your own creativity. Really? I'm gonna go hang out with the subs and do their job. <laughs> what a joke, dude. I mean, they're professionals. They get paid to do their job. What does he need to be out there for? I mean, we could be here, look at this. Sweating again, he could be your helping us out, but whatever, I guess when you're the boss, you just do whatever you want. And back on the job, I'm just hanging out with these guys. This is Jared, and he's an electrician. And this is Jared's boss, Nate. I actually built Nate's house, and I noticed that he talks with his hands even more than I do. <laughs> nice job, buddy. On every build, I walk through the house with Nate to double check what the homeowner and I have decided on the electrical to make sure it's actually going to work and get the final placements yeah, for all the switches and, and lights and fans. Up there. This is Jared's prized measuring stick named Bertha. She's 26 inches long, which happens to be the height you need to drill the holes to pull wires off of the bottom plate. One of the first steps of the process is to mount all the recessed can housings in the ceiling and sometimes this takes a lot of measuring to get everything symmetrical and lined up with everything else in the house. Next, the switch boxes and receptacle boxes are mounted to the wall and then wiring is pulled off this spool 
to connect all of these parts to each other and also back to the main breaker panel. All right, our electrical panel is going right here. And so they have to drill all the wires for the home runs right here. Unfortunately, <laughs> there's a truss exactly underneath this wall. So we're gonna fur this wall out an inch and a half so they can drill all their wires up, you know, right on the edge here and get into the panel. And this will still work in the mechanical room as the spot. Ray, I could make these guys so mad if I loaded this full of nails right here. <laughs> I'm telling you, I mean like mad, but I won't do that. It's very important for them to label the wires as they pull them because they all look the same and that way you know where they go on the other end of the wire. Each wire is also stapled in the center of the stud at about a 16 inch increment to keep it dead center so it doesn't get hit with nails from either side. All right, let's check out this 200 amp electrical system on this house. This is called the meter base. Duke Power will bring a power line from like way over there, whoop, uh, underground, and it will come up in a conduit into the bottom of here. They will mount the meter, which in the old days was the thing with the dial that spins, but now it's digital. And so that's where the power comes into the house and there's breakers in there, 200 amp. This is the very back side of that panel and this is a service wire that comes in the house from the back of that panel and it travels through the truss system and it pops up through the floor right there. So we're gonna go up there. All right, we're upstairs now, and this is the electrical panel for the house. You can see that service wire that we were just looking at comes up and into this panel. These are all the separate circuits for the house. Each one has a wire, and they all go to a breaker inside of this panel box. Uh, it says, do not remove. This is so that we don't get paint or other sheetrock dust inside of this uh, while we're working. That'll get removed. All these wires will get tied into a separate breaker that connects it to the service wire, and feeds it power. Now each one of these, called home runs, feeds to a separate circuit. Let's go check that out. All right, we're gonna follow these home run wires we were just looking at, and you can see they're bundled pretty closely together, running through the house to different circuits. We'll follow one of them here. Let's follow this black, really heavy duty looking one right there. And it travels down to right here, and that's where the stove will plug in, and that's a heavier duty wire than most of the circuits in the house because the stove pulls a lot of power. If you turn on the eyes of the burner, it just sucks the power. So each wire has to be sized for the circuit or the appliance that it's gonna be running so that it doesn't trip the breaker or catch the wire on fire, melt the housing. Some of the home runs just run down the wall and into a switch box and that will power all the lights on this circuit. One of those legs will get tied into each switch so that each switch has a hot leg and actually, I have a video of this whole thing getting tied up. Let's watch that. It's pretty interesting. After separating the wires so Myron can see what he's actually doing, he strips the protective covering off all of the switch leg wires in this box. The switch legs are the wires that run from the switches to one of the lights, and they are only hot if the light switch is turned on. This particular box will have three light switches, so Myron separates and organizes each set of switch leg wires to be behind one of the switches Next, he strips out the home run wire, which is the hot wire that will power all of these switches, and also the tie hot wire, which is a wire that will tie to the home run and run to the next box to power it. The next step is to bond all of the ground wires together. They're twisted together, and then the excess length is trimmed off, and a crimp is added to keep them connected. Three of the ground wires are left running long, and one of those will go to each of the switches in this box. After that, all the neutral wires are bonded together and nutted off, then they are tucked into the back of the box. Next, Myron bonds the three switch legs that will go to the first switch and be controlled by that switch. He then runs one leg off of this bonding because the switch can actually only accept one leg to the back of the switch.
And finally, the hot wire and the tie hot wire are bonded together and three legs are run off of this bonding, one for each switch in this receptacle. And that's it. These wires are tucked in so that the roto zip doesn't hit them when the drywall guy goes to cut out the box. Really? What do they got? He's got to hold their hand or whatever? I guess so. I don't know. I mean, I saw his bike was on the back of his truck, though. All I know is I'm glad he's not stealing any of my tools this week. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Let's finish this thing out by checking out the heat and air system in this home. Most of the supply and the return lines in this home are made from this flexible insulated duct. Each duct is fitted with a boot at the end, which is the metal part you see here, and it is air sealed at each end. Then the duct will be put into place and it will accept a metal register that will be on top of the finished surface in the end. All right, so here's how this thing works. Basically, we have an intake duct here and an intake duct here, and those are called returns. They pull air into the bottom of this unit, which is the air handler. Then the air is heated or cooled over a set of coils that is connected to a condensing unit outside. And then it goes into the ductwork, which is the supply lines, which go out and snake around into each room and over here, through here into this truss area and then into this area. And so that's how this thing works. It just recirculates the air and heats it and cools it using an outside condenser to heat or cool coils that the air is passing over. All right, here's the thermostat wire and there's one upstairs and one downstairs because this system is zoned for two zones. All right, so here's this unit and it has this one thermostat and the other thermostat downstairs. Here's the wire, I'll show that. And the reason that's possible with one unit is because it has two mechanical dampers and one is for one zone one is for the other so if one thermostat is calling for heat and air and the other one's not this one will close allowing just cooling on this side or it could be the opposite or it could be both at the same time which is pretty cool and also this is where the line sets come out to go to the outside unit and actually those are right here they're not connected yet uh, when they come back to do the final trim out these will be turned connected here and these run outside to the outside condensing unit and that's how the coolant is heated or cooled by that outside unit brought directly in here to the coils on the inside unit. Okay let's follow this line set down through the floor trusses crossing over down the wall along with the drain and right there it turns out you got a nail plate we got the fire caulking so that's where it goes. We're outside here now, and that's the other end of those line sets, and this is one solid piece with no breaks all the way up to that mechanical room. The outside unit will sit right here, and those will be connected here, as well as the thermostat wire, which will control the outside unit and the inside unit together. This is a drain line for the inside unit for condensation. Here's the placement of that outside unit on sort of a wider angle. And this is where you approach the house, the driveway, that's the entrance side. So we usually try to stick these outside units sort of out of sight. And this is off of the master bedroom, which isn't ideal, but these things are really quiet these days uh, compared to the old ones. You could hardly hear it through a wall. So we thought this was the best place out of sight. That's where we're doing it. This big fat orange wire will power the outside unit. And usually there has to be a disconnect box right here so that you could pull a breaker and then work on this unit and know that the power is disconnected and nobody could flip it on, not knowing that you're working on the unit, uh, that's a safety thing. And if there was ever a time that I wished the air conditioning was actually working, it was today, but it was like 90 degrees and you can't get away from that heat. And that's it for today, folks. It wasn't everything about every system, but I hope you learned something about something. And if you did and you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to this channel. Give this video a thumbs up, and we really appreciate that. We'll see you next time. Man. <laughs> what happened to you? Just talking, man. It just gets all over you. And then it gets all over our scaffolding. Yeah. I was wondering why our scaffolding had this <laughs> stuff on it. Looks better that way, doesn't it? Now I know. It was you. Yeah. <laughs>